Sea turtles are some of the most magnificent and wondrous animals alive today, enriching our already captivating oceans with their striking presence. These organisms represent an ancient and complex evolutionary history spanning over hundreds of millions of years, and in this video we're going to explore some of that fascinating history, to uncover just how the sea turtles came to be the remarkable creatures they are today, and why it's so important that we don't lose them to extinction. Modern sea turtles are all part of a subgroup within the much larger order known as the Testudines, which includes all of the currently surviving animals we know as turtles, tortoises, or terrapins. So, to get a better understanding of the context in which the specifically marine turtles evolved, let's take a look at the origin of Testudines themselves, which is going to be much easier said than done. What exactly turtles are has been a matter of debate amongst scientists for a long time, as you can clearly see by the number of citations for this one sentence alone, and even now their precise relationships to other reptiles are still being contested and further refined by new studies. At first, it had been thought that turtles were actually not very closely related to other living reptiles at all, with some scientists classifying them within a group known as the Anapsids. These are traditionally thought of as the most basal or primitive of the reptiles, from which all other reptiles diverged early on, and generally the main feature that indicates an Anapsid is the lack of any openings in the skull in the temple region. Turtle skulls do indeed lack any openings in this area, and so it was thought that they must be the last surviving anapsids, separate from the other group that contains all other modern reptiles, called the diapsids. In diapsids, there are generally two pairs of openings in the skull near the temple. However, more recent molecular and morphological studies have since gathered a great deal of evidence suggesting that testudines are, instead of being anapsids, actually diapsids that secondarily lost the extra holes in their skulls, converging on the anapsid condition but being firmly placed within diapsids. So that's one problem solved. Sort of. But once it was known fairly certainly that turtles are diapsids, the next issue was what sort of diapsids are they? A lot of studies have been done to try and answer this, but unfortunately many of the results conflict with one another. To put it simply, various morphological as well as molecular analyses have been performed in order to classify the testudines' relationships to other diapsids, with some of these analyses finding that turtles are more closely related to lepidosaurs, the group containing lizards, snakes, and the tuatara, whereas others have positioned them closer to the archosaurs, which includes crocodilians, dinosaurs, and birds. A few different studies have also placed the testudines in yet other evolutionary groups, too, including some outside diapsids again. So, it's a pretty confusing time, and new research is still being done to figure out where exactly we should put turtles on the Great Tree of Life, but hopefully someday we'll have a more sturdy, precise view of what relationships these animals have. However, despite not being entirely clear yet on what kind of reptiles turtles are, we can still explore their early evolution and the anatomical changes they went through, as is shown by the very oldest fossils belonging to the lineage. The most ancient possible turtle ancestor is a creature called Eunotosaurus, which lived during the Permian period about 266 to 259 million years ago. Whether or not this species is actually closely related to turtles has been debated, with some studies finding it to be a para-reptile, and therefore not close to testudines, whereas others classify it as a true stem turtle. However, in some cases this second classification then pulls turtles out of diapsids and places them as anapsids once again. Eunotosaurus certainly does display some fairly turtle-like features, with flat, wide ribs that sort of appear like the early stages of a primitive shell, but without an actual shell yet, and some vertebrae similar to certain testudines. But these characteristics could be the result of convergent evolution and not actually indicative of a close relationship, according to some other research. After Eunotosaurus, the next oldest potential turtle relative is the mid-Triassic age Papokelis, a relatively recently named animal that was only described in 2015. Interestingly, when this fossil was analysed, it provided some good evidence for turtles definitely being diapsids, as well as uniting with Eunotosaurus and the younger Odontochelis species in a grouping just outside true turtles, making the three species stem turtles. That is, animals closer to turtles than any other group, but that aren't true turtles themselves. It also resulted in the Sauropterygians, the group including the plesiosaurs, pliosaurs and others of the Mesozoic, being classed as stem turtles too, in addition to the whole turtle plus stem turtle grouping having a position close to the lepidosaurs. Not only this, but even more recently, an examination of the bone histology of Papakellus revealed some interesting details of the evolution of the shell. 
Controversially, the younger Odontocelis, which I mentioned earlier and which was a definite stem turtle, had been interpreted as being a fully aquatic animal, suggesting turtle shells had first evolved in an aquatic setting. However, the analysis of Papocellus instead showed that this animal was at most only semi-aquatic, or possibly a burrowing animal, indicating that shells evolved in a more terrestrial environment. Papocellus also had a wide body with expanded gastralia and ribs that appear like the first stages of a shell, and some of the gastralia, also called belly ribs, are even fused, forming a structure resembling the plastrons, the underside of the shells, of modern turtles. After Papocellus comes another quite recent discovery that seems to complicate things a bit, Eorhynchocellus, named in 2018 based on a fossil found in 228 million year old rocks in China. This organism, though it had flat, broad ribs, lacked a plastron or carapace, but did have a beak and no teeth, confusing since some later stem turtles seem to have had teeth again. The discovery of Eorhynchocellus therefore demonstrated how there was a bit of mosaic evolution occurring in the various branches coming off the stem turtle lineage, with some more derived and some more basal features showing up in these species. The next oldest species we know of from this lineage is then of course Odontocellus, named in 2008 and discovered in 220 million year old rocks also in China. This animal demonstrates how the underside was the first part of the turtle shell to evolve, possessing a fully developed plastron, but no carapace just broadened ribs and some fused neural plates. Additionally, this species lacked a beak like in the earlier Eorhynchocellus, showing how complex and non-linear this early evolution was. After Odontocellus, we come to Proganocellus, a creature that, for a long time, was thought to be the oldest stem turtle, living about 210 million years ago. This taxon shows a fully formed shell with fused ribs, and the relatively short time between when Odontocellus and Proganocellus lived would seem to indicate that the evolutionary development of the carapace happened quite quickly in evolutionary terms. Of course, you can imagine the mystery surrounding the evolution of the turtle shell that obscured this part of animal history for many years, seeing as before the discovery of Odontocellus in 2008, all we had was this suddenly fully formed shell in an ancient creature with no way of telling how it got to be that way. Fortunately, new fossil discoveries have provided us with so much more detail into this fascinating time in evolution, and hopefully they will continue to do so in the years to come. So, now that we've looked a bit into the very earliest evolution of this great reptile lineage, let's skip forwards and examine where sea turtles are placed within the true turtle grouping. Today, there are two main suborders within Testudines, known as Cryptodira and Pleurodira. The major difference between these groups that led to this classification is the way in which the animals retract their necks. In cryptodires, they pull their heads straight back into the shell in between the shoulder girdles, whereas in pleurodires, the neck is moved to the side, and the head is tucked into an area just in front of the shoulder girdle. Although, sea turtles have actually lost the ability to retract their head and limbs into their shells at all. Cryptodires contain most of the testudine species alive today, including all the terrestrial tortoises, in addition to the sea turtles themselves, and some freshwater turtle species. On the other hand, the pleurodires are a much smaller grouping, containing mostly freshwater species. So, let's get right into the origin of sea turtles. As I just mentioned, the modern sea turtles, which are all members of the superfamily Chelonioidea, are cryptodires, and their origin potentially begins all the way back in the early Cretaceous period, 120 million years ago. The oldest known representative of what is called Pancheloneoidea, that is, marine turtles and their extinct relatives, is a species of Desmatocellus that was named in 2015, aged at 120 million years old. This was a huge animal, with a total length of about 2 meters, and it displays quite a few features similar to those of living sea turtles. Interestingly though, this species appears to have laid hard-shelled eggs, instead of the much softer-shelled, more leathery eggs of living chelonioids. Desmatocellus is a member of an extinct family called the Protostegids, which includes some giant species of sea turtles that could get to enormous sizes, such as the famous Archelon, which could reach lengths of up to 4.6 meters. The exact classification of Protostegids, very unsurprisingly at this point, has been a topic of disagreement for a while though with proposed positions of being very basal cryptodires, of being stem chelonioids, or of being true chelonioids, closely related to the living leatherback sea turtle. Of course, depending on what they are, this would change how old the chelonioid lineage actually is, as well as potentially changing the number of times that turtles became fully marine in their evolution. However, there was a study published in 2019 that examined in detail the anatomy of a particular protostegid, 
as well as providing a more fully comprehensive overview of chelonioid evolution, finding that protostegids should indeed be placed as stem chelonioids. This means that the whole sea turtle lineage most probably originated in the mid-early Cretaceous, which fits with the age of the oldest known Desmatochelis, and then the ancestors of all living chelonioids appeared during the early late Cretaceous. So this would seem to confirm that all the sea turtles are the product of a single radiation, and the protostegids probably did not convergently evolve with the other chelonioids. They shared a common ancestor with them, being derived from terrestrial and freshwater species that gave rise to the fully marine animals. Many of the ancient sea turtle groupings were affected greatly by the end Cretaceous extinction event, the catastrophe famous for wiping out the non-avian dinosaurs, and by modern times there were only two families of sea turtles still alive. However, before we look at those surviving families, it's also worth quickly noting that there was actually a completely unrelated group of turtles that in fact did apparently converge on the true sea turtles, the Bothremiadids, a family of Pleurodires that lived from the Cretaceous and died out early on in the Neogene. At least one species within this group was also definitely fully marine, differing from the usually freshwater creatures it was related to, and demonstrating how diverse many turtle radiations were in the past. And the Bothremiadids were not the only ones to converge like this. A mostly Jurassic family of turtles, classified within the Cryptodires and known as the Plesiochelyids, were also swimming about in shallow marine environments long before the Chelonioids. However, these animals would have looked quite different to modern sea turtles, and were not closely related. Another unrelated Cryptodire with marine tendencies was the late Cretaceous age Angolochelis, and there was also the Pleurodire family Araripemididae from the Cretaceous to Paleocene. Anyway, moving back to the true sea turtle grouping, the two currently living families are Chelonioidae and Dermochelioidae. Chelonioidae is the larger of those groups, being comprised of six of the seven living members the green sea turtle, the loggerhead, the hawksbill sea turtle, the olive ridley sea turtle, Kemp's ridley sea turtle, and the flatback sea turtle. Dermochelyidae contains just one surviving species, the leatherback sea turtle, the largest of all living chelonioids. The members of the larger family, Chelonioidae, possess shells composed of hard keratin plates called scutes. However, the leatherback, hence its name, lacks this hard carapace, instead having a very thick, leathery skin covering a fatty layer that's filled with oil and embedded with thousands of small bony plates known as osteoderms. Unfortunately, almost all species of surviving sea turtles are now at risk of extinction, with three species classed as vulnerable by the IUCN, one as endangered, one as data deficient, and two, Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtle and the Hawksbill Sea Turtle, as critically endangered. One of the most distressing things about the condition of sea turtles is the fact that were the leatherback, which is vulnerable, to go extinct, it's the very last of its kind, and therefore that would be the end of an entire reptile family that has a history going back to the time of the dinosaurs. Indeed, if any sea turtle species were to disappear, it would be a huge loss to our world, and the oceans would feel like a slightly emptier place. The conservation of these animals is, as I hope this video has helped you to understand, incredibly important, since to lose a chelonioid is to lose an iconic and ancient part of our planet's history. So if you would like to learn more about the current state of these animals and what dangers they're facing, as well as the conservation efforts to save them, there's actually a part 2 to this video that you should watch, over on One World. This is a channel started by my mum, who has a PhD in marine biology and it's focused mainly on the many conservation issues facing our world today. She's just done a video on the conservation of sea turtles, so if you've been interested in learning about this lineage's ancient history, you should definitely go and watch this video about their troubled future. So, I hope you enjoyed this topic, and I hope you appreciated my efforts to present as many of the current uncertainties about this fascinating topic as I could, in order to avoid favouring any particular view of this time in evolution. Of course, this is still an ever-changing field of research, so I don't doubt that parts of this video will become outdated in the near future, but hopefully I've been able to give you a decent overview of what we currently know about this group's evolution. If you're interested in keeping up to date on new turtle evolution discoveries, be sure to keep watching 7 Days of Science, where we'll make sure to try and report on any new developments that occur. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.